Uh, good afternoon. I think we're ready to start. And welcome back to the second session of On the Loneliness of Being Chief Justice Roberts. In today's session, Professor Ryden will dissect the factors contributing to the court's plunging approval ratings and consider how they may affect the court's future decision and direction and jurisprudence. For the benefit of those in the Zoom audience, and for those of us who have hearing problems, including me, please wait for the microphone when asking a question. Raise your hand if you have a question or comment, and someone on this side will come up and hand you the mic, and I will hand the mic on this side. Anyway, with no further ado, welcome Professor Ryden. Thank you. Good. Uh, good. I was just about to say good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. All those rules. Ah, you know, if you forget the mic, I can always repeat it. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I do chaos. That's what I do best. Uh, happy to see you all back. You know, I always, when I do a two session thing. I'm always a little nervous that I'll be speaking to an ex uh, empty room the second time around. So uh, as always, it's a treat. It's a pleasure to engage with Haspers. Uh, and this topic is a good one and a timely one. Uh, I thought we had a great session last week on a more general level. Appreciated your comments, questions, a few of you came up afterwards and pushed back. I always especially love that. Don't hesitate to do that. I'm constantly fighting this fight with our students over this trend towards self-censorship. And it's increasingly a problem in the classroom. Um, and I know that's not gonna be a problem in this classroom. Um, so take that, take that to heart. We're just gonna, we're just gonna jump in. Uh, as I said, last week was kind of the general primer on the court, uh, and today we are going to delve into what I call the Roberts Project, which is John Roberts' effort to save the court from itself, perhaps, um, and a project that takes us deep into kind of questions of legitimacy, how we understand that, what the court is facing today. Uh, these are interesting, fascinating, and important questions. A little more esoteric, I think. So I'm demanding more of expecting more of you today, all right? Um, having said that, do not hesitate. If something is, right, you're not getting it, it feet, right, it's uh, having trouble grasping, it's clear as mud, let me know, let me know. Stop, get a hand up, throw something in my direction. Um, uh, happy to deal with questions, clarifications, uh, and that sort of thing as we go. Okay, so take that to heart, please. All right, what I call the Roberts Project. Uh, it was a polarized uh, and divided court that John Roberts joined in 2005 and that he was tasked with leading as Chief Justice, one that was increasingly politicized, uh, especially through the confirmation process, as we talked about last week. Uh, it's important, I think, to note that the actual formal powers at the disposal of the Chief Justice are meager at best. The most significant formal power is assigning of the opinion in cases where the Chief is in the majority. Otherwise, the Chief's prerogatives include an annual report on the state of the court, to which few pay attention, uh, the occasional public address, and the management of oral arguments and conferences in which the justices discuss the cases. In short, there's little uh, which empowers the Chief of Justice to alter in, er in any definitive way or manner the ways in which the court functions. Despite this, Chief Justice Roberts, in his early days on the court, revealed an ambitious, some would say audacious, goal to reshape a court of disparate Lone Ranger independent members into an actual court, a unit that might act institutionally and speak with an institutional voice. So better to demonstrate that it was not consumed by political differences, that it was capable of consensus on the rule of law and how to apply it, the end being to enhance the legitimacy and standing of the court with the public. 
the first signs of what I call the Roberts Project surfaced even before Roberts took the bench uh, in his testimony before the U.S. Senate in his confirmation hearings. And he made it clear that he thought, quote, considerations about the court's legitimacy were critically important, unquote. He spoke of modest approaches to judging and of modest judges who only decide the issues before them, who limit their decision making to interpretation and application of the law and not to judicial legislating. He analogized the role of the justice to an umpire calling balls and strikes. The implication being that judging was a neutral and objective function untainted by politics or partisan pressure. I love that when a serious question gets a chuckle. John, you've turned into such a cynic over the years. <laughs> uh, before the Senate, Roberts testified that, quote, one of the things that the Chief Justice should have as a top priority is to try to bring about a greater degree of coherence and consensus in the opinions of the court, to decide cases in ways that would allow more justices to join the majority so that the court speaks as a court, unquote. Justice or uh, Roberts rather would elaborate at some length a year later after completing his first term as chief when he sat for an exclusive interview with Jeffrey Rosen, now the president of the Constitution Center in Philadelphia for a profile, to, a lengthy profile to be published in the Atlantic Monthly Journal. In the conversation, Roberts expounded on the importance of the court's institutional voice. Rosen described Roberts' views this way, quote, the most successful chief justices help their colleagues speak with one voice. Unanimous or nearly unanimous decisions are hard to overturn and contribute to the stability of the law and the continuity of the courts. By contrast, closely divided 5-4 decisions make it harder for the public to respect the court as an impartial institution that transcends partisan politics, unquote. This is why Roberts as chief prioritized unanimity and collegiality on the court. He suggested to Rosen in that interview that, quote, the court is ripe for a refocus on functioning as an institution. Because if it doesn't, it's going to lose its credibility and legitimacy as an institution, unquote. He repeatedly invoked the language of the court acting and functioning as a court rather than a gaggle of individual justices penning separate opinions and undermining the court's institutional voice. His goal, consensus, helping his colleagues see the benefits of the team dynamic, of broader based decisions or even unanimity. So to recap or restate, the central aim of the Roberts Project was judicial legitimacy, the strengthening of the court's public standing and prestige in the eyes of the citizenry. The path to this aim was to move away from what Roberts called the, quote, personalization of judicial politics, unquote, uh, which manifests itself in fragmented decisions with multiple concurring and dissenting op opinions, supplementing the majority opinion, running on for dozens and dozens of pages, sometimes into the hundreds in big cases. This increasingly routine practice of separate opinions detracted from the court's institutional voice, its capacity for speaking singularly as a court, as an institution. The clearer the court's institutional voice, the greater its legitimacy, the greater the force of its decisions with those expected to adhere to them. The Roberts Project. We good? Okay, everyone's with me, good. All right, why does it matter? Uh, why this emphasis on the court's institutional voice? Uh, because in a common law system, which is ours, with Supreme Court decisions carrying great precedential weight. The force and the legitimacy of the court's decisions will determine and shape the benefits that are presumed to flow from the rule of law, stability, knowability, predictability, certainty, consistency, efficiency. The more the court speaks with a single voice, 
a clear, cogent, coherent, consensus-based voice, an institutional voice, the greater the gravity of its decisions, the greater the respect for those decisions, the more secure the rule of law. There's 28 people on. I didn't match sure what that was. <laughs> okay, for Roberts, the path to unanimity and consensus was methodological, to use a social science word. It would be realized through decisions written narrowly as possible, with the court only deciding what was in front of it and no more, eschewing anything not absolutely essential to resolving the question. The narrower the decision, the more modest, the more incremental, uh, the greater would be the number of justices willing to sign on. The goal was 9-0 or 8-1 rather than 5-4 or 6-3, okay? A steady flurry of 5-4 votes would, in Robert's estimation, undermine the public's confidence in a nonpartisan objective court and result in what he called, quote, a steady wasting away of the notion of the rule of law. Okay, hence Robert's approach, which has been called minimalism, judicial minimalism, modesty, incremental, not big, broad, bold decisions, right? Modest, minimalist decisions deciding simply the question before the court and no more. That's the method right, to what Roberts hoped would yield greater consensus, a greater institutional voice, okay? Uh, to make it clear, right, that one could, and I'm gonna offer a couple examples, right, one could see at various points in times, Roberts practicing this minimalist approach, often to the chagrin of his fellow conservatives on the court. There are several striking examples, quite a few, but several in particular I'll focus on, uh, whereby Roberts practices what he preaches, subordinating his preferences, his judicial philosophy in the interest of greater judicial consensus and institutionalized legitimacy. At key moments in his time on the bench, Roberts has based his actions on preserving the court's legitimacy, even if it meant sacrificing his own view of the constitutional question under review. Example number one, National Federation of Independent Businesses versus Sibelius, 2012, uh, better known as the case involving the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, okay, referred to commonly as NFIB uh, versus Sibelius, 2012. Okay, this was the uh, much kind of anticipated uh, Supreme Court opinion uh, involving the constitution of the constitutionality of the statute and in particular of the individual mandate. Right. Obamacare required that if you were uninsured, you needed to go out and get insurance. Right. It mandated that uninsureds acquire uh, insurance. And we referred to that as the individual mandate. And so that was the focus of uh, kind of con the constitutional question. And the case came after, you know, at least a couple of years of rabid politicking, relentless attacks on the bill. Uh, conservatives were sort of waiting with bated breath that this would be their opportunity to defeat in court what they couldn't defeat uh, on the floor of the Senate, right? Um, the key question at issue was whether requiring that someone enter the insurance market was a regulation of commerce. That's Congress's constitutional power, the power to regulate commerce, okay? And so the question was whether a mandate, mandating someone to, to acquire insurance, whether that was a regulation of commerce under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, uh, or whether it was the creation of commerce, and hence outside uh, Congress's power under Article I, Section 8, a fairly legalistic distinction was forcing someone to buy insurance. Was that creating insurance or was it a mode of regulating insurance? If the former, unconstitutional. If the latter, constitutional under Article I, Section 8 in Congress's delegated powers. Okay, all right, good. Um, Roberts reached the conclusion that all good conservatives uh, would have reached. <clears throat> Namely, that the individual mandate was not 
a regulation of commerce. Okay, it was not a regular regulation of commerce. And hence the Affordable Care Act was unconstitutional, right? No, <laughs> no, it is still with us, right? Um, not so fast. Uh, in fact, what does Roberts do? He pivots to Congress's taxing power. Okay, and in a wonderful sleight of hand and in a practice of creative lawyering, right? He says, no, the penalties, if you fail to uh, uh, get insurance under the individual mandate, that's a form of tax. And it falls within Congress's taxing power. And voila, the, the, the statute is upheld, okay? Um, reports had, uh, and these are always wonderful reports, they, are, they revolve around leaks uh, emanating from the Supreme Court building and um, usually the court is more immune to leaks and rumors, uh, but every once in a while it happens. This was one of those cases, right? Those reports had uh, Roberts drafting the original opinion in a way that would strike down the statute. Um, and then the reports were that he got cold feet uh, and found a way to uphold the statute. Um, my take on this, and that I'm not alone, right, is that if one were judging the chief by his desire for a more narrow uh, decision, uh, like one could almost read his mind in this particular instance, right? How would it look that, uh, for the Supreme Court to overturn a law that Congress had toiled on like they had with this one that dealt with what, one sixth of the national economy, healthcare, um, right. In short, I think it was hard to see Robert's highly creative jurisprudential exercise as anything other than an effort to husband the court's prestige and reputation. Example number one. Uh, and uh, he got kudos. He got wonderful comparisons to uh, Chief Justice John Marshall back in 1803 in the famous Marbury versus Madison case when Marshall engaged in similar politicking to establish the court's power of judicial review. That's a story for another time or for the question and answer time, if we have time. Okay, that's example number one. Example number two, June Medical versus Russo, 2020, an abortion case. All right. To understand what Roberts did in Russo, June uh, versus Russo, we need to go back four years to what happened in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt, 2016. Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt. That case involved a Texas law that imposed various regulations on abortion and had various licensing requirements and other requirements imposed on doctors who performed abortions and the kind of training they had, their proximity to a hospital, uh, these sorts of things. Okay, a number of regulations imposed on the practice of abortion. Uh, without getting into more details, the Supreme Court found that those regulations were an undue burden on a woman's right to choose an abortion. And that was the standard, an undue burden. It was an undue burden that violated the Constitution. Uh, court strikes down the Texas law as violating a woman's right to choose. Vote 5-3. Five, three. This is 2016, a vacant seat uh, around the recently deceased Antonin Scalia. Okay. Roberts stood with the three, the dissenters. All right. Not surprising. Um, he is on the conservative side on abortion jurisprudence by and large. So he voted to uphold the regulations. He was one of three dissenters. Okay. Flash forward four years, now it's June Medical versus Russo 2020, and it is almost the identical statute that is at issue, that was at issue in Hellerstedt four years earlier. Well, why is an identical statute before the court only four years later, which is sort of the blinking of an eye in when you're talking like the Constitution and constitutional change? Well, because we'd had some changes in personnel, right? And we had had two justices, two conservative justices added to the courts. So everyone sort of speculated this was not likely to turn out 5-3 liberal. It was likely to turn out 5-4 conservative. And that was the expectation. In fact, 
That's not what happened. Instead, the court ends up by a five to four vote striking down the legislation as it did four years earlier in Russo. Okay, nothing remarkable about that until you look to the makeup of the court and the five includes Chief Justice John Roberts, who in fact assigns to himself the writing of the opinion. So he writes the opinion, uh, striking down the regulations that were essentially the same uh, that had arisen in a case four years earlier, which he voted to uphold. What is going on here? Okay. Uh, and Roberts writes very openly in his opinion. Um, he was not changing his mind on the underlying question. He held the views that he'd held four years earlier on the constitutionality of those regulations. He thought they were constitutional. He would have, if just left to his own vices, he would have voted to uphold them. Uh, but he sacrificed his personal view for what he thought to be the good of the courts. Okay. Um, stare decisis, um, respect for precedent, right? The court's standing required hewing closely to the earlier uh, Hellerstead case. To do otherwise in the face of changes in personnel would have led people to believe this was nothing but, could be attributed to nothing but the personal politics of the justices, okay? Robert's concern for the image of the court uh, led him to do something that went against what he personally, in terms of his judicial uh, philosophy and practice, what it would have led him to do. Uh, really interesting case, okay? All right, so those are a couple examples, like Roberts puts his money where his mouth is, at least some of the time, right? In, in some pretty high-profile cases. In fact, I would say he's more likely to do it in high profile cases when he thinks people are watching, right? When, he, when he, people are watching what the court is doing. Because that's when you really have kind of perceptions of legitimacy that really come into play. Okay, makes sense? Questions before we sort of plow forward? John. How did he get appointed? How did John Roberts get appointed? <laughs> How did he get appointed to be Chief Justice? Um, yeah, so he, I need to make sure I get the right chain of, of events. Um, because So it was night 2005. He was originally appointed by uh, George W. Bush to take the place of the retiring Sandra Day O'Connor. Okay. Uh, Sandra, right, the swing vote was stepping down. Uh, and so George W. Bush put Roberts up to take her place as an associate justice on the court. William Rehnquist, who had been ill with cancer, um, but who had not stepped down, who was continued, right, Chief Justice, the, the acting Chief Justice on the court, um, all of a sudden became very ill. And after W had had nominated Roberts, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist passes away. Okay, and so now W right there has not there have not been hearings there has not been formal action taken on Roberts's nomination, uh, and so George W. Bush kind of shifts him over um, to the Chief Justice the 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 opening in the Chief Justiceship and nominates a second person for the opening associate justice position. So kind of a little dance there. Yep, yeah, yeah. Yep, of course. That's always the case. Yep. Is the purpose of the court to um, to be team players, work together, or is the purpose of the court for them to know the law and to understand what the law means as they interpret it? Um, let me answer your question by asking a question, which is always fun, right? You guys, you just, you can't be lumps, right? I want you guys to jump in here. Uh, let's go back to 1954. Uh, and, uh, the Brown family have challenged a segregated law in Louisiana that requires separate schools for white and black. Okay. And the question before the court is, is that a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. 
Okay, this is happening in Louisiana in 1954, interpretation and application of the 14th Amendment. Would it have made a difference if that decision were, all, even if it were ultimately decided the same way it was decided, would it have made a decision if that were a 5-4 or 6-3 decision in favor of the Brown family versus what it in fact was? And what was it? Unanimous. It was unanimous. Did how the court decided that case make a difference? I see some nods. Why? You, so what unanimity in and of itself? Why? And what are we talking about here in Louisiana in 1954? Yeah, and what? I mean, what? where did the populace stand in much of the South? They were opposed. There was deep resistance, right? Um, uh, and so Chief Justice Warren like, was utterly committed to a unanimous decision in that case, right? There were a couple, there were a couple of the judges of the justices who were resistant. Not, not for racist reasons, they were la largely for kind of federalism reasons and kind of the deference they wanted to show towards kind of state and localities, especially in the realm of education. Um, but Warren said, no, this is something we need. We need the court to speak as an institution with a single institutional voice. And I would say he was absolutely right. Okay, that, that made a difference. So there are times, oftentimes, when, when I think it is necessary that the court speak with an institutional voice for the purposes of legitimacy, um, right? And you know, I think the court got it right, obviously, in Brown versus Board. I think that was a fairly easy case in terms of the 14th Amendment, right? There are lots of other cases that are really hard and that might really raise tough questions. So I think to Bush versus Gore, in 2000, right? The picking of a president, you know, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Um, if I would, regardless of the outcome, regardless of, of where you found yourself in the court, what the court was doing and what it decided, what it ultimately decided, I would have hoped for a stronger institutional voice to lend credibility and legitimacy to the outcome. Right. It wasn't the, the, the application of the law, find the answer to what happened in Florida in 2000 in the elections under the Equal Protection Clause was by no means clear. I mean, it was murky and muddy from a constitutional standpoint, and it was playing out with these unbelievable facts with the country, at least me, like with bated breath, watching every moment on television, like for five weeks to see what happened. Um, that was a case where I thought the court needed to, at the end, when you cast your vote and you've lost, you probably need to submerge your own viewpoints for the good of the country because, you're, because your voice needs to have that institutional oomph behind it to give it legitimacy. Make sense? What do you think? You sounded skeptical of kind of the team player mentality. Let can let him respond yeah. if you're going to ask something. Yeah. Has there ever been a situation where uh, it was somewhat of a split decision, but yet it went through and it, uh, it there wasn't the support by the country because of that? Probably. <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a Supreme Court historian, so now you're really putting me on the spot. So say that again. Was there ever a situation where it was not unanimous, and the case did not have the kind of backing because of that? That's what you're saying. Um, I think there was a bit of that in Bush v. Gore. Um, Although it was surprising, in my mind, it was surprising how people sort of accepted the result. Uh, but I do think, I think George W. Bush, he took, he took uh, the inaugural oath with a cloud over his head uh, because of that. Uh, I honestly think he had sort of legitimacy questions to some degree. They weren't necessarily hugely debilitating. 
But I think that was a case where if you had a stronger institutional voice, uh, it would have made a difference. Um, on some of these social issues, questions where the court is deeply divided uh, and you get, um, right, you get the same question or a similar question that comes before the court in subsequent cases. Uh, and the dissenters feel it necessary to continue to dissent and doing not doing the opposite of what Roberts did in the Russo case. That really bugs me, right? That If it's short term, right? If it's a, a precedent that is three, four, five years down the road, right? You, sub, you lost your <laughs> dissent, right? Five years ago. Uh, now it's incumbent, I think, to add that institutional voice. That's happened, yeah, and, and, and conservatives and liberals both are guilty of it. Um, they they won't kind of let it go. Yeah. So is, to follow up, is that um, when and how does that happen? Does the chief justice do a little arm twisting in the course of conferencing and saying, come on, guys, we need to be unanimous in this? Or how does how does that happen? Um, yeah, it depends. Um, and much of this, we don't, we don't always know how much arm twisting goes on behind the scenes. So in the Warren court, you had Warren and you had William Brennan, who were the leaders of the court. And Brennan was a notorious arm twister, right? Or a lot of times we need the passage of time to really get a, a read on sort of judicial history. Their paper, a lot, a lot of times the justices, they right, they need to die before the papers, right, are released. Even then they might put a condition that's like you can release my papers 20 years after my death. So it just takes time for that to happen. But it became clear William Brennan was was uh negotiator extraordinaire on the court in the 50s and the 60s. Um, and he did it like no one else and knew how to play others. To, a lot of times, not only to get the results, but to get added voices to the result. Roberts doesn't have a reputation as being a big arm twister. Um, I think, right, he tends to try to do it through some of these public pronouncements and these statements. He's made it clear he, he kind of wants his brethren and sisters on the court to uh, play nice, to be team players to a certain extent. Uh, he'll do it in an opinion. Right. He'll do it in opinion. We'll talk in a little bit about the Dobbs case when he wrote the concurring opinion, trying to do that and failing miserably. Yeah. Yeah. Todd. David, isn't it um, a fact that and, and not well known fact that a significant percentage of Supreme Court cases, in fact, maybe even a significant majority of Supreme Court cases are decided on a unanimous basis? or a near unanimous basis. And <clears throat> we don't hear about right. those right. as a general rule. We hear about you know the big disputes because yeah. that's they tend to be the higher profile cases. And you know, disputes are like the car crashes on the eleven o'clock news. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. That, that Unanimous is, decisions, they don't generate clicks or readers or viewers. They're boring, right? Uh I mean, Todd, you just got into my conclusions, one of my few concluding thoughts. So I'll say it now and it'll save me time later, right? We are going to talk about sort of the legitimacy legitimacy crisis. I will argue that much of it is manufactured. For political purposes, and it's it's something of a fake crisis, uh, and some of that has to do with this perception of the court as just so divided. And I plead guilty, I because ple I I end up doing that as well. I, I simplify right the court and the divisions on the court um, as if they were greater than they are. Uh, but that's the public perception, right? As we just have these two blocks, conservative, liberal, and near the twain shall meet. And that's false. They meet a lot more often than they don't. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just reading a study that's just published, um, and the authors did an op-ed piece in the journal or New York, I forget where. And they had that the gist of their research was this idea of this, right, this implacably sort of polarized court. It's just not true. Okay. Overall, yes, there's an incredible amount of consensus on the court. 
Now the divisions happen to occur around these really high profile cases. Okay, so number one, they tend to happen in constitutional cases, right? So when it's kind of statutory decisions, there's a striking amount of uh, kind of unanimity consensus around how the justices read statutes uh, and try to answer kind of questions under those statutes. Um, so it tends to be it tends to be constitutional questions that divide them, and then it's the big ones, right? And it's it's abortion and it's religion and it's kind of equal protection um, and and speech rights and these sorts of things uh, that divide members of the court, and so they get they get all the attention. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, I think it's something of a uh, inflated uh, crisis, um, and it's in it's in. Right. Many of those who are screaming, right, illegitimacy, illegitimacy are doing so. They have an agenda, right? They have a political end that they are trying to advance. So, yeah. One more question, and then we're going to move on. Would you go back to that Latin term, stare decisis, and explain that? Stare decisis, let, decisis. The, deci let the decision stand. Fancy word for precedent. Right. Let the so the court using prior decisions as a guide to resolving similar decisions in the future. Right. They're not remaking the wheel every time a new case comes down the pipe. Right. Starry, just let the decision stand. Um, people will misinterpret starry decisis as sort of a hard and fast rule. It's not. Uh, it's a principle that the court has sort of carved out for it. It's not necessarily a constitutional provision. It's a judicial practice principle that the court employs um, uh, in the name of efficiency, right? But also in the name of those, those sort of um, values, those policy um, outcomes that we want to encourage under the rule of law, which is stability, predictability, right? We want the law to be knowable. Uh, because people and lower court judges and politicos and all sorts of people are gauging their conduct pursuant to right what the court is saying. So we don't want this zigzag back and forth, and hence this policy of precedent. So a guide, not a straitjacket, a guide. So there might be circumstances that eventually come to be where the court will legitimately arrive at a position that we got it wrong before, um, and we're going to take a new, new position on that yeah good uh okay um let's continue so i would argue uh, that the roberts project was highly successful um, for much of chief justice roberts tenure on the court his first term 54 percent of the court's decisions were unanimous uh, I would say, you know, owing at least in part to his rookie status, the willingness of his senior colleagues to give him something of a honeymoon. Uh, nevertheless, that was an astounding number historically. Uh, as recently as 2020, so three years ago, Jeffrey Rosen, remember him of the Constitution Center, in a reprise of his 2007 article in The Atlantic, he characterized Roberts as, quote, just who the Supreme Court needed, unquote. Uh, as Roberts led the court deftly through a thicket of politically perilous cases that included abortion, showdowns with President Trump over immigration, uh, subpoenas of the president, uh, challenges to COVID policies, uh, a challenge to voting in the Electoral College, conflicts over religion and non-discrimination, and on and on and on. Uh, Rosen describes it this way, at a, quote, at a time of greater partisan conflict between the president and Congress than any time since the Civil War, as Americans are questioning the legitimacy of all three branches of the federal government, Roberts worked to ensure that the Supreme Court can be embraced by citizens of different perspectives as a neutral arbiter guided by law rather than politics, unquote. I described what actually went back and looked at uh, some lectures I did after that year as I recapped that season. I described it as the, at the time, as the most impressive, savvy, and effective display of political leadership that I had witnessed in my lifetime. 
with Roberts navigating these lightning rods by uh, by getting something for everyone, garnering uh, near unanimous votes in divisive cases by convincing colleagues to cast narrower, more modest opinions. And he did it uh, in the looming shadow of what was sure to be a hugely divisive upcoming presidential election. Uh, Rosen, in his 2020 article, credits Roberts with, quote, establishing his own preeminence by working with his colleagues to maintain the court's bipartisan legitimacy at a time when the other branches have lost their own, unquote. In other words, to a voice no less eminent than Jeffrey Rosen, the Roberts project was a stunning success. Hint, not so fast. <laughs> right, flash forward three years. Um, and we chuckle at Rosen's and my, I guess my assessment, right? The odes to Roberts have been replaced by piteous characterizations of him as a lone voice abandoned in his project by colleagues on left and right. The ideal of greater Supreme Court legitimacy crashed on the shoals of abortion, changes in the court's personnel, and a level of partisan animosity and polarization that continues to spiral downward. Liberal Washington Post columnist Ruth Marcus calls him a tragic figure. Progressive Supreme Court commentator for Slate, Dahlia Lathwick, in what reads like an obituary, confesses to actually feeling sorry for Roberts, saying, quote, he will likely be remembered by historians as the most principled chief justice ever to thoroughly lose control over a court in real time and in plain view, unquote. The picture is one of consensus and judicial legitimacy lying in tatters on the ground. The collapse of the Roberts project is best exemplified by the, uh, the Dobbs decision, the case which overturned Roe, and Roberts' fruitless efforts to work his magic and extend his project to that dispute. In that case, if you recall, right, at issue, so this is Dobbs versus Jackson, Whole Women's Health, that's the full case, 2022. At issue was a Michigan, Michigan, Mississippi statute prohibiting abortions after 15 weeks, what, we, what was known as sort of the, the gestational um, age of the fetus. The law was clearly in conflict with Roe v. Wade and with Casey versus Planned Parenthood, which is sort of the, the uh, successor decision to Roe both of which found a constitutional right to abortion and determined that that right could not be limited prior to viability, 23, 24, 25 weeks. Okay. Hence the conflict between the Mississippi statute, 15, 15 weeks gestational with Roe and Casey, 24 weeks viability. Okay. Um, if you recall, we had the famous or the infamous, perhaps leaked opinion of uh, Associate Justice Sam Alito. Uh, Alito writes for a six member majority who voted to uphold the Mississippi law, okay, upholding the cutoff at 15 weeks. Five of those six also voted to overturn Roe and the Casey decisions, okay? Thus returning the issue of abortion to state legislatures to be uh, resolved politically. The three liberals in dissent would have upheld Roe and Casey and would have struck down the Mississippi law. Chief Justice Roberts aimed for the middle and wrote a concurring opinion that would have upheld the Mississippi law. So siding with the conservatives, upholding the 15 week gestational cutoff uh, but he would have retained the overall right of abortion, at least for the time being. His reasoning, we don't need to overturn Roe and Casey to decide this case. Minimalist, right? We only need to decide what's in front of us, the Mississippi statute, not the constitutionality of Roe versus Wade. His argument for a more modest or minimalist opinion won over no one. Okay. And in the wake of Dobbs, we have witnessed the seeming implosion of the court's standing with the public, the loss of the legitimacy that Roberts feared the most. All right. So uh, in uh, so let's kind of move to uh, to sort of that collapse of legitimacy, kind of see if we can measure it and think about reasons why. 
Um, uh, you can, I think, look to some different uh, sources to find these questions about the court's legitimacy. One of those sources is public opinion polls. I would say always take a public opinion polls with a huge uh, sort of grain of salt because people tend not to know very much about the court. But also remember, we are talking here about perceptions, popular perceptions of legitimacy. So polls, polls are going to matter. They're going to reflect that, right? Uh, Gallup, uh, the highly respected, longstanding Gallup poll, uh, put trust in the judiciary at 47%, uh, the lowest ever since Gallup started doing surveys on the court. Um, the Gallup survey showed the court's approval rating at 40%, a historic low. Um, that was down about... 25 points uh, over the course of a couple decades. Um, it had dropped 20 points just in a matter of a couple of years. Uh, if you look at Democrats, the numbers get a lot worse. Uh, only a quarter of Democrats approved of the court. Uh, less than half of independents approve of the court. Uh, some pretty striking numbers questioning the court's standing. Um, uh, I was going to mention Pew Forum, which is equally uh, well regarded and really notable for their even handedness. They have similar kind of numbers. I'll kind of pass over those in the interest of time. Approval of the court has always kind of been something in flux. It tends to go up and down, particularly when the court takes on like really big cases. Uh, in cases that are likely to make somebody mad, right? So after Bush v. Gore, after Citizens United, after Obergefell, right, the same-sex marriage case, you would get the courts uh, standing plummeting. And then in a fairly short period of time, it would come back up, right? One side would really struggle with the outcome, and then they would pretty quickly make their peace, and the approval of the court, the estimation of the court would sort of come back up to that level. OK, in this instance, the stubbornness of the court's low numbers raises the distinct possibility that something more serious and perhaps longer standing uh, is going on. OK, so we've got poll numbers. We've got headlines. And so I actually just got on Google last night and, and just Googled like headlines on the court. It was a pretty productive search. Love that, you know, right? The Google, the Google is great. He tells me all sorts of things, right? Some illustrative headlines from Vox News. What happens when the public loses faith in the Supreme Court? From the Guardian, it's time to say it. The U.S. Supreme Court has become an illegitimate institution. From the Washington Post, Supreme Court dogged by questions of legitimacy. From the Harvard Law Review, we're going a little artsy here, right? The Supreme Court's legitimacy dilemma. From the Alliance for Justice, how the Supreme Court is destroying its own legitimacy. From the August New York Times, is the New York is the Supreme Court facing a legitimacy legitimacy crisis? From the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, the Supreme Court has a giant legitimacy crisis. That was about the first page of what the Google gave to me, right? I could have gone, I could go on for a long time, all right? Um, so uh, what's going on here? What, what do we, um, to what do we attribute this seeming implosion in the court standing? So we get to some of the reasons, right? Reason number one, uh, we talked a little bit about this last time, um, and that's kind of genuine anger over the, Mar the uh, uh, Merrick Garland, sorry, the Merrick Garland nomination by President Obama in 2016 to replace Scalia, um, right? And, and the, the Senate refusing to act on that, Trump wins the election and then uh, nominates Neil Gorsuch, right? A conservative in place of a liberal. Um, on a much broader scale, there is a narrative that really sort of uh, that on the left really sort of characterizes this entire court uh, as illegitimate, as uh, there being issues with virtually every one of the more conservative members of the court uh, being of sort of questionable legitimacy. So Clarence Thomas, the longest reigning, the longest sitting member of the court, right? Many of you remember back to the Anita Hill scandal. Right. Check against him. Roberts and Alito in the uh, aughts, uh, appointees of George W. Bush, the loser of the popular vote, lacking Democratic uh, backing. 
Gorsuch, we know about Gorsuch. Brett Kavanaugh, right? The teenage sexual harassment scandal that was aimed at him. Amy Coney Barrett, the hypocrisy of Mitch McConnell and the Republicans in putting her nomination on a glide path and a very fast one. Okay, and those final three justices, right, all nominated by he who shall not be named, right, who lost the popular vote by three million by three million votes, right. So that narrative, right, that narrative has really taken place among a sizable, like, like one swath of the country, right, that the court is in fact illegitimate in its makeup and how the justices who got there, how they got there. Okay. Yes. That's what, it's coming. Yep. For those of us who are more inclined to listen to stuff about personalities, what about Ginny Thomas and the ethical questions, not only of her political actions, but also all this questions about the code of ethics for the Supreme Court? Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. That's a good reminder, right? There are there are kind of granular questions around ethics, around conflicts of interest. Uh, Clarence Thomas has done himself no favors, right? By by his willingness to uh, accept gifts and the largesse, right, of of others for trips and whatnot. Um, yes, his spouse. Tamp it down, Ginny. Tamp it down, right? Um, that so those those are those are real, right? I I think they're relatively minor concerns to these these larger questions, but they're not nothing, and they're not inconsequential. Uh, yes. So that is, and that's where I would say right, where legitimacy questions that may have largely been on the left are kind of expanding to include many in the middle right um these are long stand and just just to be kind of equal opportunity right these are long standing problems right so ruth bader ginsburg in her the year before she passed away she had something like 14 international trips right she wasn't paying and right uh anthony kennedy love right he was the great international law scholar he loved to accept uh, free trips to this is what this is how he would spend his uh, summer. Um, so that has been sort of routine. And so there is right among the legacy media, they're certainly going to have someone like Clarence Thomas in their crosshairs uh, and not necessarily give attention to some of those others. And then the other quest, I mean, yeah, I mean, Ginny Thomas and her sort of um, unhinged politics and doing it in a very public way. Right. I mean, the reality is everyone in Washington is married to somebody else who is an influencer. Right. So the the power couples, again, they cross partisan lines um, and sort of everyone is guilty of it. She just has a knack for, you know, giving a media that are waiting to pounce to give them lots of fodder. So those I think those. Yeah, they're I want to put them in the right context, but they're not they're not nothing. Right, yes, and um, on kind of ethical, yeah, she was just commenting that, um, yeah, those questions around ethics, say it again and I'll repeat it. Kind of right, right. Uh, it has sort of been a so the comment was the perception of ethics um, and the court being kind of being answerable to an ethical code, uh, right above sort of the hurly burly, you know how we view actual politics. You scratch my back. I'll, what can we do for each other? Right, that is gone. I think that's right. Um, right, and there I think the chief has not done him and his colleagues any favors by just really so strong. Like, I do think these are largely about perception, right? I do think when you get member, when you get people on the Supreme Court, guess what? Their judicial philosophies are pretty settled. Um, and they're not going to, they're not going to change how they vote on a case because of these things. But 
We're talking perceptions, right? We're talking perceptions. And so an ethical code that might not leave questions of recusal to the justice herself or himself, but would have some sort of external referee or decision maker. I think those would be good things. And the and Roberts has been just utterly, utterly resistant, which is peculiar. I, you know, I think, well, maybe not. I mean, the justices, they very much want to correct, kind of protect their own uh, prerogatives and that's what he's doing. I'm just not sure it's wise. So, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, so one is makeup of the court. Um, second factor, I like in my notes, I had, I think it had number three in the outline, but push it up to number two, which is abortion, 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 right? Triple exclamation mark, right? The fact that Dobbs dealt with abortion, right? It's just, it's hard to overstate the ideological commitment of the left to abortion. Right. And what that represents, not only as a policy, but as something larger in terms of kind of individualism and in those sorts of things. Um, and so the overturning of Roe, I mean, there were these concerns, these questions of legitimacy beforehand. Right. The Dobbs case was galvanizing. Right. It was a catalyst uh, to what has what I would say is a more sort of intentional effort to delegitimize. Okay, so the presence of abortion. Uh, third, and I think more fundamentally, right, progressives are in the minority of the court, a clear minority of the court for the first time, arguably, since 1937. All right. Uh, they don't like it. Surprise, surprise. OK, I think there's a general sense of despair in the face of a conservative majority uh, that it seems like might be around for a long time, uh, might be around indefinitely. And so I kind of tried to characterize the attitude that is, if you can't beat them, delegitimize them. Okay. And I would argue that's what they've done and have done with some effectiveness. Right. And so that has translated into uh, a campaign among progressive elites in the legacy media on the liberal side of the political spectrum and among the legal academy uh, to do just that. Um, here again, I went to ask the Google for some representative uh, language, announcements, headlines, and here is a sampling. Okay, here is a sampling from Andrew Koppelman at Northwestern Law School. The court is, quote, the most politically extreme and partisan court, not in the last 80 years, in American history, unquote. Uh, Well-known UCLA law professor Erwin Shemarinsky calls the justices, quote, partisan hacks, unquote. Ruth Marcus, I mentioned before, the longtime Washington Post columnist, she won up Shemarinsky, accusing the court of, quote, insidious political hackery, unquote. Adam Liptak, the New York Times, you notice these are not fly-my-night media outlets. We're talking about the Washington Post, the New York Times, right? These are the most influential organs uh, in the country. Uh, Liptak calls the court an imperial court. The New York Times editorial board pleads who can rein in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Lee Epstein, a noted constitutional scholar who I've had the pleasure of working with, uh, accuses the court of a position of judicial supremacy over the other branches of government. Gr uh, Linda Greenhouse, longtime uh, uh, New York Times uh, Supreme Court reporter, now retired but still writing, uh, says the current majority is abusing its power. She asks rhetorically, quote, what happens if the country decides that the court is deploying its power irresponsibly, even illegitimately, unquote. The once august New Republic drops any pretense, urging political leaders, especially uh, liberal political leaders, to stick with what's been working and keep up these lines of attack on the court, unquote. Um, uh, the podcast I listened one of a, a legal podcast, which um, um, highlights uh, two professors from Michigan Law School, Strict Scrutiny, the latest headline from that podcast, what fresh hell will this Supreme Court term bring? Um, in this morning, a Vanity Fair article calls the court reactionary, an institution on the brink, a vehicle only pursuing Republican legal causes. Um, and then perhaps most disturbingly from members of the court itself, uh, Associate Justice Sonia Sotomayor in oral arguments in the Dobbs case, referring to the stench emanating from the court. 
uh, from Associate Justice Elena Kagan, a little longer um, public comment she made in a speech. If over time the court loses connection, all connection with the public and the public sentiment, that's a dangerous thing for democracy. Unquote. Kagan goes on to say that judges, quote, undermine their legitimacy when they don't act so much like courts and when they don't do things that are recognizably law and when they instead stray into places where it looks like they're an extension of the political process or where they're imposing their own personal preferences, unquote. Um, and more recently, we've actually seen some back and forth between the justices, um, and it's really unseemly. And here it's on both sides. So you have Sotomayor making a comment like that from the bench about stench. Um, you have Sam Alito, who, who will not go quietly into the night, right? He is, he's, now that, now that Scalia's passed away, he's the most uh, pugilistic of the conservatives on the court. So you have him writing multiple op-eds on the pages of the Wall Street Journal, kind of defending the court. I'm not sure we want the court and its legitimacy coming down to justices kind of arguing uh, back and forth in public venues, okay? Before I offer a couple of concluding thoughts, let me pause and see about questions. All right, two parts. Um, the first one easy, what other podcasts you listen to? The second one, it seems like the court, whether it's just perception or I just pay attention more, the whole concurring opinion where the justice is suggesting a new line of here, the next case should be about this and we'll take it on. Is that always been there or is that more recent with the current court makeup? Uh, what podcast do I listen to? Uh, well, geek territory. The most important one is geek territory. No, no, no. Unless you're a Minnesota twins baseball fan, you're not going to listen to that. one. Yeah. That's my boys talking twins baseball. Okay. Um, Legal, I try to like hear, like I have my views on things. So I try to get some from both sides. I try not to live with pods in my ears. My wife accuses me of using them as a way of drowning out her and our children. Um, there might be some truth. Uh, so I try to limit it. In law, I have judicial scrutiny on the left and I have advisory opinions on the right. Uh, which is David French, of whom I'm a big fan, is sort of an evangelical Christian who's really kind of uh, middle, not middle of the world, a little center right. He and a colleague, Sarah Isger, have a, really a good one for really dissecting legal questions. Um, st strict scrutiny is more on kind of on constitutional questions. Advisory opinions is kind of broader. Those are my two, my two law ones. I'll, I'll spare you the other ones. They're not they're not necessarily good for public consumption. Yeah. The other part of the question. Oh, uh, what was the other question? The, um, advisory, the uh, concurring opinions. The concurring not opinions, they're, they're right, routine, right. New case. Yeah, is this a new thing? Is it uh, the proliferation of concurring and dissenting opinions is a new, it's relatively new, right? And by relatively new over the course of the last several decades. I can't tell you, I can't speak to, like, I can't offer kind of empirical evidence of how often these opinions were done at a particular era. But this idea of a fragmented court is something that has been, that has characterized the court for the last generation. Um, and it, it is just a prolifer. So you can think back and, and there would be the rare dissenting opinion Right. John John Harlan, wasn't he the known as the great dissenter in the Plessy case where the court put its stamp on Jim Crow? He was the lone voice. Right. And you might have a dissent like that, someone who was known for uh, like kind of moral clarity and could see in the future and would write a dissent that someday would become Brown versus Board of Education. Um, right. Middle mid 20th century, you had obstinate. Uh, justices like Felix Frankfurter and Hugo Black, right? Black was sort of a purist when it came to text and free speech. And so he, right, the rest of the court would, right, take a fairly loose interpretation of the freedom of speech. And he would write a very cranky dissent about the words on the page and, right, shall not abridge the freedom of speech means shall not abridge the freedom of speech. Um, so, so they were bigger, they weren't as common, uh, and they, weren't they weren't 50 pages 
right? So I study the court. I study constitutionalism. Uh, and for me, it's important to like read the opinions and what are they saying? Um, like I've got a life, I've got children. I have to teach classes. I want to listen to my podcasts, right? It is a disincentive to, to, to look at a, an opinion that has nine opinions and there are two, there are a total of 280 pages. So what does that do? It fragments the court and the voice of the court, and it also makes them more inscrutable. It really makes them more inscrutable, less transparent, um, right? You used to be able to write a grand federal statute in 15 pages, now it's a thousand, right? That same tendency really has come to afflict the court and the work they do. So on all the big cases, right, everyone has to add their two cents worth. Yes. In these classes that you give us, you've taken a lot of complexity and you've distilled it down to more simplicity that we can understand the key points or the key issues or the reason for a decision or uh, what's at stake. In the newspaper or in media, you just hear um, politicized versions without going to the reason why decisions are made. Ignorant question. Why don't we have simpler coverage? like what you're offering? Yeah, that's that's a good question because I do think, I think the media are, like we rely on them, right? We rely on them to make digestible and comprehensible what is pretty challenging. Most of us being normal people are not gonna sit down. We're not gonna pick up the 200 pages that was the affirmative action case out of Harvard and UNC, right? And pour over it, right? We are reliant on someone to sort of do that for us and to, to distill it down uh, to the essence. Um, I think the state of the kind of the Supreme Court kind of journalistic class is pretty awful. Uh, like it's really pretty awful. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I would go to the, the um, what is uh, the Science Monitor, Christian Science Monitor, right, um, as a really good one, and, and down the middle, and when they do law stuff, right, there are, there are uh, Charles Lane, who used to do Supreme Court coverage for the Supreme, for the Washington Post, it's really good, he's been replaced by someone who's, dare I say it, is something of a political hack, right, uh, and these aren't the good newspapers, um, the New York Times reporter at LipTech is generally good, um, but by and large, uh, you have the legacy media that is I mean, there's a strong leftward lean, and then you have the alternative media, uh, and there's a strong rightward lean, right? And it's just it's hard to it's hard to do what you're saying. Uh, and so, actually, I think like podcasts, if you can find someone who's interesting and good and fair-minded, and you have if you are out walking the dog or right, this is what you do when you're washing the decision the dishes or doing the laundry. You know, there are some. That might be a way of uh, of doing it. Um, you know, the other thing is like the legal academy, right? All those names I listed; these are high profile, highly regarded law professors, and they are they are um, they're not being honest, right? They have a they have an axe to grind. And again, right? You have two lanes now in the legal academy. The left lane is just much more, you know, it's 90% of the legal academy. The right lane is about 10%, and it's a handful of law schools. Um, but we are reliant on them to, to help sort of translate for us and to do that in a way that is fair. Um, and they aren't very fair. So that's, it's a problem. I don't have, I don't have a great answer for you. We are reliant, right? The media mediate for us. Right. What comes through? What what come? Right. That's what the newspaper is doing or the online sources. And they don't always mediate them. Sometimes it's a, a prism through which the truth is pretty badly skewed in one ideological direction or another. Yeah, that's that's kind of a depressing answer. Yes. I just want to say that or comment on how the partisan or the politicalization of the court system since Bork in the federal has filtered down to the state level as well. I just want to spend a minute talking about Wisconsin, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Somewhat. In yeah. two, 2010, the Republicans did a great job of putting a lot of resources into state 
legislative raises because of the census and the ability to redistrict. Uh, and having put that effort in in Wisconsin, they won both houses. They were in charge of the redistricting. They set up a supercomputer across the street from the state capitol. I was I was a circuit court judge at this time. Mm. Um, and they did the redistricting with a vengeance such that for the last 10 years, 45% of the vote will be for Republicans, like for the state legislature, 45%. That 45% gets converted to 65% of the seats in the legislature. Wisconsin Supreme Court has been conservative, uh, under conservative control the last 15 years. They approved that redistricting. Um, Wisconsin's kind of a purple state. We had a race this past spring that would result in either a change in control uh, of the of the um, Supreme Court. So it was the most expensive race in the history of the country. $54 million got spent on a judicial race in Wisconsin this past spring. The more liberal judge won. Con control of the Supreme Court shifted over to the liberals. Right away, two cases got filed attacking the redistricting. The new justice, when she was running, revealed that she thought the redistricting was unfair and that she thought something should be done about it. Republicans demanded that she recuse herself from these cases. She disagreed. They started to talk about impeaching her. Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> it's, it's a crazy, crazy way to run a system. Yeah. Um, which is why, you know, for all the supposed complaints about the court and a legitimacy crisis, uh, don't give me don't give me judicial elections. Yeah, I mean, what has happened with the Wisconsin Supreme Court? You know, um, yeah, it's hardly sort of this judicial vision of right judicial actors who are presumably above the fray of politics. And right, Wisconsin is only the latest of any number of state Supreme Court uh, judicial campaigns running into the tens of millions, um, incredibly politicized. Um, it's 10 after, let me offer my three concluding remarks. We'll take about three minutes and then we can spend the last 15 minutes because I know there are some additional hands. Can we, can we do that? Um, so here are three bullet points to end. Number one, um, I would argue, I think I said this, that I think the proclamations of a legitimacy crisis are overwrought. Uh, the argument that this, or the accusations that this is a rogue court out of control, ignoring precedent with impunity, impunity is based upon a single year by and large that was historic because of Dobbs uh, and a gun case that was on the docket um, in fact it takes much longer to for a court to take shape and to gel I mean uh, it's a fascinating what makes the court so fascinating to study they're sort of organic um, and justices operate and behave in ways that are not static they're dynamic and the nine are not static they're dynamic um, we already saw evidence last this last term, right, of a court sort of moderating some of the things it was doing. Um, and that will continue, right? I have my thoughts on what we might see. And it's not necessarily going to be a hard six-member conservative majority every time, right? There are different lanes even on the conservative side. Um, and so time will tell. Right. Uh, what Todd mentioned about a good deal of consensus that doesn't doesn't get the headlines. OK, so read those sky is falling. Um, headlines about a legitimacy crisis. Right. Read those with a strong dose of skepticism. OK, number one. Number two, the attacks on the court are dangerous. Given the importance that trust plays with respect to this particular institution, right? For progressives who have uh, historically been the ones who elevate judicial power, um, right? They ought to be careful lest they end up knocking down this institution. Political tax on the court's legitimacy are as troubling when it's highfalutin law professors who are doing it as, when, as it is when Donald Trump is doing it, okay? Um, be careful lest we undermine the court standing. Number two. Uh, number three, this will be my final point. 
right, is that equating of the court's legitimacy with public opinion is precisely how we ought not to think about the court. Okay, let me say that again. Equating the court's legitimacy with public opinion is exactly how we ought not to think about the court. They're not a judicial super legislature. The legitimacy of life tenured, unelected judges, right? That should in fact flow from their ability to withstand public pressure, right? And the goal is justices who do their best to ground decisions in the text and the history and the structure of the constitution. And that should be the ultimate test of legitimacy. Okay. All right, we've got about 15 minutes, so. We have yes. a question from Bridget. Would you comment on the shadow docket and whether it is being utilized more often and how it is affecting the role and perception of the court? Yeah, lots of concerns over the shadow docket. The shadow docket is, right, any given year you have the regular docket. Um, and that's, right, that's uh, petitions that are uh, for review are submitted and and the clerks, right, the cert pool, remember from last week, and the clerks and then the justices through the rule of four might take cases, place them on the regular docket for a full hearing that involves full briefing, full oral argument, and then decision. Uh, the shadow docket exists to deal with issues in a more expeditious manner, okay? Um, there is evidence, again, I'm not a Supreme Court historian. I can't speak to the kind of the use of the shadow docket over time with detail, right? Uh, on a very simple level, there has been an increase in the use of the shadow docket, right? Uh, that raises concerns because oftentimes it doesn't have the same level of sort of a full, a full hearing and it's truncated um, and it's quickened. Um, you don't always get full opinions with justices signing opinions with a full, a lot of times you might just get a per curiam, a very short per curiam opinion that issue that gives you the result. Um, so the lack of a full hearing on the one hand and the lack of a full accounting on the other raise concerns. Remember how we think about the court. How do they establish their legitimacy? They convince us what that what they're doing is persuasive. Right. That's what the opinions are for. And they convince us that this is grounded in the Constitution and the text and the history and the structure of the Constitution, right? The shadow docket, cases coming out of the shadow docket don't always do that, all right? And so that's a legitimate concern, certainly an uptick uh, in recent years. Um, I think the last year or two, it's sort of fallen off. Uh, there's been a lot of high-level criticism of it and that may be landing. The other thing, it was an acknowledgement of this little thing we went through called the pandemic, right? And so that just generated a lot of legal questions, uh, big constitutional questions about religious liberty and assembly and, and pretty important questions. And the, right, the, those time mattered, right? Those, there was kind of a sense of urgency to a lot of those cases. So I think those played a part in kind of elevating the use of the shadow docket because because kind of big questions needed to be uh, decided relatively quickly. Um, you know, I think there are questions about, like one of the things that I think should ease our concern there is sort of uh, the extent to which a case off the shadow docket has the same precedential value as a case that gets a full hearing and a full opinion. Um, and that's not always the case, right? A lot of times it's more, it's sort of more quick and it's designed to answer a question for now. Okay, so good, good question. Yeah. David, there are many of us who, I'll speak for myself, who are unutterably opposed to the candidacy of Donald Trump. We are feeling that there are a lot of people, we, we are wondering, why is it that people would vote for Trump? Why? And I think the answer is, if abortion is everything, is the most important thing in all the world is to pr protect those unborn babies, Trump has delivered. Trump has delivered, and therefore, we are going to overlook 
his unsuitability, his 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 personal lifestyle, the way he handles staff, everything about his tenure as president has been awful. <laughs> now that's 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 the over Your point of view. <laughs> that, that's my point of view. Yes, that's, right. that's overstating. Oh, I know I it's it. overstating. Yeah. No, well, how do you really feel? It's overstating. I mean, it's hyperbole, right? <laughs> but but could you say that you know the the perception that we have is that the Supreme Court is an extension of the Trump Republican uh, feeling. McConnell stops what normally happens in the history of the United States is when you have a little bit more liberal president, he gets to put somebody on that's a, a suitable there. Uh, and, you know, so it's it's a case of revenge, 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 and the partisanship that has always existed in the history of the United States. It's always been there. And under Trump, it has been exaggerated, exaggerated. And now we have these this polarization, which is out in the open more than ever. Please, please comment on it. <laughs> Where are the minefields for me to step in? Um, there might be some Trump backers in this room. I think the idea that his presidency was demonstrably worse, right? Many of the Trump folks would say, no, nah. I look at some measures here. They would argue with that. So, but this is not about elections, right? Uh, I'm trying to tie down a date with someone on Hass for February and March. So get it on your calendar. We'll go deeper. All right. I will try to make this about the courts uh, and the judiciary. Um, uh, and I'm going to disagree uh, that I don't think Trump's uh, unshakable support among 35 percent of the public has much to do with abortion. Um, he has said, like for people, I'm pro-life. I will put my cards on the table. OK, I've told for those of you who've heard me before, you know, that's that's my take on it. Um, he's he's made things. He has made it transparently clear that he doesn't care about abortion. He doesn't care, right? He, uh, he it was um, uh, certainly uh, a strategic kind of position he took as president, but he has said things in the last several months that show, no, he's mad at the court for overturning Dobbs because it's made it harder for him to get reelected. Everything that he does or says is, it's about his narcissism and it's about the expediency of getting elected, okay? Um, now, there may be some during his presidency, you know, I'm also an evangelical Christian, and I look with shame on how evangelicals align behind Donald Trump with apologies to those of you who might be Trump backers, right? <laughs> there are reasons to be a Trump backer. Um, I, I'm not going to, but as an evangelical Christian, I found much of his conduct just beyond the pale, Right. And so even for evangelical Christians for whom abortion was a big issue, I think during his presidency, there there was that was one more reason for them to stay in the stable. Right. Um, but to say that Trump kind of the Trump Republican Party was responsible for the court that overturned Dobbs. Uh, no, no. Uh, the reason Donald Trump was so successful in one area which is judicial nominations, was because he farmed it out. And he gave it to the Federalist Society. Uh, and the Federalist Society, they have a clear and distinct and coherent conservative kind of judicial philosophy. Um, and that was the one area, right, if left to his own devices, oh, Lordy, you know, what would that have looked like? Um, but he farmed it out. Um, and they acted very much as any conservative Republican president would have, right? So the court, the court looked no different, right, at the end of a Trump administration than it would have if it were uh, Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz uh, administration, right? It would have been the same. They would have put the same kind of conservatives, right? The conservatives he's put on the bench are... Right. They're good, solid, well-qualified conservative jurists. There's nothing remarkable about them. Right. And that's that's kind of, they're coming from the one side. Right. That we talked about last week. Um, so. 
Yeah. So then kind of moving forward and looking at just the unshakable support for the president, even in the face of things he said on abortion that that I think are egregious. Right. So does that. Yeah, I want to be a little uh, a bit of a contrarian there in terms of kind of what you're suggesting. Thank you for, for uh, being more moderate than, than I am. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, John. okay, this is a little out of the blue and out of your department, but it is about a Supreme Court. Before the Hamas uh, deal happened, there was a lot of talk about uh, Netanyahu wanted to find a way to reduce the power of Israeli's Supreme Court. Any comments on that? Uh, no, that's outside the realm of this class. It's outside the realm of my expertise. It, it, the only way I think it mattered was there was there was just a level of division inside Israel, and that what Netanyahu did with that was really to sort of heighten and amplify the divisions. And when you are, when a country like Israel is all bound up in this division, right internally, I think you could argue that maybe in some way contributed to the sense that Hamas could do this and would have the freedom to do it. But I don't know. I, I'm not going to say anything more because my ignorance will become readily apparent very quickly. Yeah. My question, though, is on the elitism of the court, because what, eight of the nine justices come from Ivy League law schools. And I just got to believe that, you know, there's some good law schools out in various other parts of the country. And does Notre that name Amy Coney Barrett? Right. Well, we won't go there, but OK. Oh, no. Oh, she's no. exactly what we want. We want someone who's not a product. Of, well, I'm oh. talking about Notre Dame, though. So, oh. OK, let's let's keep it real. Oh, we like talking. Football. I, I was thinking of Missouri, sports? to be honest with oh. you. But but does that cause some of the problem? I mean, it's we're dealing with. But, you know, part of the reason that the Supreme Court struggles to do minimalist, modest rulings is because what do we got coming out of the Congress? Nothing minimalist or modest. In regard well, nothing's to coming out of Congress. Well, that's part so of it. I, I would argue that's nothing comes out yes. of Congress. And then that elevates the sense on the court's part that they need to do something. And that, to me, is a reflection of, of an elitist mindset. It's not the court's job to do something, right? They are unelected. They are life tenure. They serve for 35 years plus. Right, they are products of the most elite stratus stratum of of society, um, and they are taking on these social uh, issues. And they think they ought to be able to step in for you and me and make these sorts of decisions. This gets the populist in me rising to the surface. Um, and so, to that and so to that extent, I will be in that camp that talks about judicial restraint. Judicial restraint. Right. These elitists have no business doing much of what they do. Right. And it is not their role to somehow save us from a, a, a do nothing Congress. Right. We hold that power and it's called elections. Right. And that's how we do it. So I, I do not like the. Yeah, there's lots of good law schools out there. There's lots of smart people graduating at the top of these law schools. The Harvard Yale pipeline is ridiculous, I think. So vote me president and I will uh, bring someone in from my University of Minnesota Law School or, or someplace else. Yeah. You're right. And we have one more question that we have to stop. We're reaching 2.30. So okay. we have your final question coming. You say so. Right. I'm not so sure this is a question as a, much oh. as a statement. Okay. okay. Comment. Presumably the Supreme Court, whether it's the Supreme Court of 200 years ago or today, is there because they are looking to interpret and follow the Constitution. Well, Roe versus Wade made a decision, interpreted the Constitution. 50 years later, I mean, during that 50 years, there were attempts to overturn it. Now, suddenly, in the Dobbs decision, the Constitution changed? No, it was the makeup of the court. And it just, it, it frightens me. I mean, what other decisions? Is suddenly uh, Brown versus Board of Education? I mean, that's ridiculous. It's going to be overturned because a new court comes in and says, eh, you know, segregation is good and it's fine and it yeah. fits. So leave me a chance to answer because that's a really that's a really important point, right? And that's that's a common perception. Is this court out to upend every precedent, right? That previous courts have signed on to. Uh, the empirical work suggests no. 
that they have they have overturned far fewer cases than the several courts that have come before them. Um, right. So that's kind of a popular perception, again, because of some big cases. Right. The Dobbs case is an interesting case because it raises competing understandings of legitimacy, right? And so people on the left really are voicing what you just gave voice to, right? Here we had a precedent that was 50 years in the making, and this court steps in uh, and overturns it, something that is right deeply embedded in our society, and that's not what a conservative court does. Illegitimate. OK, there is a large swath of the country on the other side who never view Roe versus Wade as, as legitimate. Um, if you listen to Dobbs, I, and I encourage you to go listen to podcasts, get on YouTube, listen to pronouncements and arguments against the Dobbs decision, and you will find hardly anyone on the left defending Roe on the merits, on the basis of constitutional law. Um, so we can argue about the policy of abortion and we'll argue till the sun goes down, okay? There's very little argument on the sort of the, con the constitutional foundation for abortion rights. Really weak, really weak. Uh, and you can look at all sorts of well-regarded liberal jurists um, like John Hart Ely, who was one of the great ones who said, this is not constitutional law after Harry Blackman's opinion came out, right? Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was critical of, of the liberty, the 14th Amendment liberty language as a foundation for abortion rights. She thought it extremely weak, um, right? So we have, right? So on the other side, you have people arguing, no, legitimacy of the court stems from a good faith effort to answer the question in the constitution, right? Uh, Harry Blackman, who wrote, who drafted the Roe opinion, I mean, if you're sort of pro-abortion rights, you could say that that opinion made a lot of sense if he were writing it as a legislator, right? He broke up the abortion regime to these three trimesters, and it was a sliding scale of protection of abortion rights, depending on where you were in the the in the uh, pregnancy, right? And more rights in the first trimester, fewer in the second, it can be uh, restricted and banned in the third. Where the heck he found that in one word in the constitution, which is liberty, he came up with that, right? So for people who, um, right, who have a moral view of abortion against it, and who have a view of the constitution that we ground things in the language and the structure and the text and the history. That case was an abomination. It was an abomination. We put it in the same category as Dred Scott and Plessy versus Ferguson, right? Um, so, so, and I don't mean to end with such strong language, but I'm saying these are competing views of legitimacy. Um, so me as a populist, Yes, I don't want these nine elitists sort of pouring their values, their personal preferences into these very vague uh, words and texts and provisions in the Constitution. If the Constitution doesn't provide it, they don't get to make it up, right? That's why we have elected um, elected officials and institutions. So that's how it comes down. So we thank, might keep on that. Thank you very much, thank you. Professor Rodney. Thank you. When they talked about people, they didn't include the Nope, nope. So, but the language, the text, I mean, they that built the text. So, okay. uh, good. good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. In Wisconsin. No, yeah, and so have we met? No, so you were a judge, you were a judge, like a judge for 24 years. Okay. About eight or